Why do humans continue to return to narratives about the end of history and technological apocalypse? I've spoken to a number of guests on this podcast about how plenty of people working on AI think about progress in terms of inevitability and how this might impact their commitments about what to do. My guest today, Professor Benjamin Breen, an associate professor of history at UC Santa Cruz, brings incredible insight to these questions. He specializes in the history of science, medicine, globalization, and the impacts of technological changes. We spoke about questions like the ones I raised above, about the history of psychedelics research and its overlap with early AI research, and plenty besides. As Professor Breen says in the episode, I really think we all ought to look to history, the history of technological changes in particular, to contextualize our current moment. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I'm your host, Daniel Bashir. If you're listening to this and you're not subscribed to The Gradient in some way, I think you should go fix that. You can subscribe to the podcast on your usual podcast player to make sure you get episodes when I release them every week. And if you want to get the rest of what we put out on The Gradient, that means this podcast, our newsletter, and articles from our online magazine, then you can subscribe to us through Substack. And finally, if you like what we're doing, it would really mean a lot to all of us if you consider sharing this or whatever else you like on The Gradient. We're a pretty small team, this podcast is a one-man effort, and the entire Gradient publication is run by a very small group of dedicated volunteers. So whenever you do share our things around, when you leave comments for us, when you give us feedback, we all really, really appreciate it. But now, without further ado, Benjamin... Breen. Professor Breen, I primarily wanted to talk to you today about a few themes between your work and what the AI community is thinking about right now. But before we get into some of these ideas, the history of psychedelics research, the concept of technological apocalypse, I want to understand a little bit more about your background. So before we even get to the research topics, could you tell me a little bit about well, why you study history? What was so interesting to you about it in the first place? Uh, thanks, Daniel. It's good to be here. And uh, I love the question. I, I always tell my students on the first day of class a version of what I'm about to tell you, because I actually study history for a very specific reason. And it's, to my mind, the most interesting question that you can ask. <laughs> That's why I'm an historian, which is if you, if you draw a population chart over the past 5,000 years, like our world in data has this information available, there's an enormous spike in the past 200 years. As we all know, there's roughly 8 billion people on Earth. If you go back not that long ago, a few hundred generations, there's roughly 50 million people. And so why did that happen? Where is it heading? You know, what is the future of humanity in that way? If you think, if you zoom out, uh, what are the causes in a, on a specific level? You know, not just humans develop, uh, you know, uh, opposable thumbs and <laughs> advanced frontal cortexes, that's too zoomed out. It's more like what was happening over the past thousand years specifically that made that, that transformation of the earth that we're currently living through take place? Um, and what can we learn from that history of the past thousand or so years that will tell us something about the future? And within that, I like zooming a lot more because historians get very specific. So my first book is on the history of the global drug trade in the 16th through 19th centuries, more 18th century. Um, I focus on that period because the, the early modern period, 15th to 18th centuries, is like the key inflection point when modernity happens, when the Industrial Revolution happens, population starts going up. Um, obviously, huge changes have, take place in politics, in culture, um, in pandemics, for instance. Uh, but really, the, my larger like interest is just seeing history against this larger context of the nature of the universe, the nature of humanity. I, I take a pretty broad view on it. And uh, even though I get very specific, I always like have that background core curiosity about humanity as a, as a whole that, that drives my interest. So how do you then think about, I feel like there's a lot of right now interesting kinds of narratives about the place we are in history and how things have sort of developed. And 
in a way, some of the discourse that's going on right now feels a little bit unique. And at the same time, it also isn't. And what I mean by that is the way that, for example, I think a lot of AI people have parroted this, what feels like an end of history kind of narrative that we're on the precipice of doing something really new. Something is really fundamentally about to change about human society. And a lot of this is rooted in the idea that, well, humans are a special species by virtue of our intellect, and you may or may not agree with that, and that is roots in enlightenment discourse and all of this. And there's something different about it this time. And then you have the people on the other side who say, well, this is just another parroting of industrial revolution kind of rhetoric. And so I'm curious as, as somebody who is thinking about this intersection of history and human nature and the kind of progress we see when you look at discourse like this and, and these sorts of back and forths, what comes to mind for you? I think about this a lot because um, I do think you're right that there's a very strong impulse at present, not just among AI people in the artificial intelligence world or even people thinking about technology, but just among my students, you know, among people who are 20 years old right now, there's a strong impulse to think that something is fundamentally different at this moment and to think in apocalyptic or millenarian terms. I, the mil term millenarian is more helpful because it can involve imagining an apocalypse or some kind of revelation or some kind of future that is fundamentally different from the present, the millennium, you know? Um, People who hold those views think that they are living through a unique moment. But one thing I learned from history is that most generations of humans are millenarian. <laughs> like if you go back to obviously the Industrial Revolution, people were thinking this is fundamentally different. Things are changing really fast. We can't predict the future. Uh, but in fact, even if you go back to times of relative technological stasis, you know, like the difference between the year 1500 and 1550, people are still millenarian in the sense that they're imagining the coming, uh, you know, the return of Jesus or the Mahdi or like, you know, pick your religious uh, framework for imagining a, a, a divine intervention in history. It seems to be a reoccurring trait. So I, I kind of have been thinking about this in the context of the present discussions of AI as sort of a, the current version, the current permutation of imagining a very common reoccurring human tendency of, of thinking that our generation is the one that will see everything change. Um, and I sort of suspect that has to do with death, <laughs> like the nature of human life, that we, we will see everything change on an individual level when we die, <laughs> right? And so it makes sense that people start imagining larger versions of that on a cultural level. I do, however, of course, think that we really are living through a peak period of change. That th Those are two separate things. Like, it's a reoccurring human trait to think in millenarian or apocalyptic terms, but the current generation of people in 2023 is is witnessing rapid change, and it is going to be interesting <laughs> this century. What's convincing you of that? I mean, just looking at that population chart, looking at um, the interconnectedness of the world. One of the themes in my research is thinking about globalization in a larger temporal context, you know, not just globalization in the past 50 years, but the past 500 years. Um, this is also the theme in my book, Tripping on Utopia, is, is you know, I, it's a history of psychedelics, but one of the main things that drew me to Margaret Mead as the person through who I told this story is that she was fascinated by uh, rapid transformations in societies due to the introduction of new technology. And she was convinced that she was living through the peak moment of danger and the peak moment of potential positive change in all of human history. And I think she was kind of right. I think that probably in, in hindsight, we will think that the period of, you know, from roughly like 1900 to 1980 was probably the, the peak of change. But uh, it's not impossible that right now is <laughs> because a lot of the things set in motion in that period, you know, the invention of the nuclear bomb, um, invention of global telecommunications that lets everyone communicate with each other rapidly or almost instantaneously, the invention of computing. Um, those things are still being played out and we're still figuring out what the ultimate, you know, downstream implications of them are. So I think that while the present moment isn't necessarily unique, it's a continuation of the, the extremely uh, disruptive and interesting and in some cases very dangerous 20th century. That sounds right. And 
I think another aspect of this too that you brought up was just the speed of transformation and the acceleration. And many people, I think, in talking about AI that I've heard, and of course, many people also disagree with this, will look at things like the rate of the number of papers being published about language models. And they'll point to this as this is indicative of faster progress. And I don't think that's necessarily actually a good measure of progress at all. But a lot of people do seem to take it to be so. And I'm curious as an historian, somebody who's looked at a lot of, I think, maybe the the broader trends in all of this. One thing that we can go back and forth on when it comes to technological progress is how technologies, when introduced, really diffuse through society. What are kind of the limiting steps and all of that? I had a recent conversation on this where we were speaking quite a bit about how even when you see a very fast advance in technology, that doesn't always manifest in super quick, massive economic growth, because there are going to be a lot of other limiting factors for social, for technical, for political, for many other reasons. And I'm curious if in your own studies, well, how do you think about in looking to the past or, or, you know, in, in your studies, these aspects of maybe we do see really massive, transformative, even technological change in like a specific area? And that maybe revolutionizes something more specific. And then on the other hand, how this more or less percolates through society at a very large scale. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot um, while researching and writing this this current book that's coming out, the, the History of Psychedelic Science book. Um, and because one thing that I don't think is widely realized is that you know, psychedelics, I should say at the outset, I'm treating them as technologies. I, I think that they are, uh, they're really two things. When we talk about the history of peyote or the history of psilocybin mushrooms, we're talking about something with very deep human history as ethnobotanicals that have been used for literally thousands of years. But LSD really was invented in the 20th century. And it's a, it's a, it is a product of advanced technology. Um, and so we can kind of separate out those two ways of thinking about it. That's why I think of it as psychedelic science is a discrete category we can talk about as a product of, of technological modernity and, and, you know, 20th century medicine. Uh, LSD was being used in the early forties and people who used it in the, in the forties and early fifties quite, I think reasonably assumed that it would become a wonder drug, you know, much like, um, you know, Valium or antipsychotics were, were perceived as like this new technology that would remove the need to have psychiatric institutions because they, you know, fix the chemical imbalance in the brain, like this new model of how the brain works. And, and they were seen as, quote, chemical keys. That was like a, they were uh, capable of unlocking chemical keys. And so it's like this idea of the brain is this understandable and something which you can intervene in, in a, in a logical way and actually fix people's mental states through chemical intervention. And that's like one of the key technological innovations of the, of the 1940s and fifties. I think it was mostly wrong, but it was considered a huge step. And uh, you're exactly right that, that diffusion of this kind of thinking doesn't always happen the way people expect or at the pace they expect. People assumed in the early history of LSD that it would become widely used everywhere. You know, it would become like a, the, the go-to psychiatric treatment in some cases. Um, obviously that didn't happen. And in many ways, we're just kind of restarting now in the 2020s, something that was, was underway in the 1950s. And progress has been made in a certain sense. You know, we have better brain imaging technology um, like fMRI and so forth. So we can understand things a bit better, but it's striking how much we just kind of didn't move forward in that domain. And it honestly, in the domain of mental health in general. Um, so there's uneven paces of technological change, but the main thing is the the cultural barriers to adoption. You know, um, it's very easy to think that, that something is a breakthrough and actually have real evidence that it is. For instance, LSD or psychedelics in general really do seem to have quite transformative effects on the treatment of addiction, PTSD, um, possibly depression. So I'm personally quite optimistic about that on a medical level, or if you will, a technological level, but on a social and cultural level, I'm getting more and more pessimistic, honestly, uh, 
because I just don't think people who approach it with an engineering mindset are maybe not fully aware of the roadblocks in place for mass adoption of, of these new technologies. Self-driving cars could be another analogy. Like, you know, it's easy to get a self-driving car working on I-280 in Silicon Valley, but if you drop it in Tehran <laughs> or Mumbai, it's like quite a bit more difficult to navigate the different, um, you know, the ways that pe- the affordances of a technology in the real world, the way it operates and the, the things it comes up against are very hard to predict when you when you release it at scale. And psychedelics for me were a great case study of this because they just completely went off the rails. There was like this techno utopian moment in the 50s and then it became straight into, you know, newspaper accounts of people jumping off buildings and Timothy Leary wearing beads on TV. And it just <laughs> goes from this really a history of technology story to a history of mysticism, history of, um, you know, cultural division, polarization. Um, I'm really curious what will happen with AI because one of the things I talk about in my book is that the same people involved in psychedelics research were the very earliest AI researchers. You know, it's the same meetings where where like Claude Shannon was meeting with a guy researching mescaline. Um, And it's to, even though I don't don't compare them too much in the book, I, I do think about it in the sense of, we're currently watching AI have rapid progress on the level of research and, and actual capabilities. But in terms of the way it diffuses in society, I think people are overestimating the speed at which it will, will be widely adap- adopted. That's really informative. I want to spend a good amount of time on this analogy that you're making, because I think this is one of really the most fascinating things that came out for me and reading your book. I was noticing a lot of the analogies you're beginning to draw between the mindset that people who were doing psychedelics research in the early days had, this techno-utopianism, and also the AI people who were around the same time. You mentioned, you know, the 1950s, and this is when the Dartmouth workshop was happening that famously inaugurated the term artificial intelligence and all these things. Maybe beginning from there, just this mindset of techno-utopianism. Could you spend a little bit of time just drawing out what that meant to different people, what was a utopia for them, and why did technology, the technologies they were building, have to play such a part? Yeah, I, I think that one of the main takeaways from this book for me in the domain of talking about a, the history of AI is that the Dartmouth conference is overrated as an origin story. If I were to rewrite the Wikipedia page for this, <laughs> I would basically say um, the Macy cybernetics conferences were the first um, the first international meeting of AI researchers. They didn't use the term yet, but they were pretty much the same people. John von Neumann was there. Claude Shannon was there. Norbert Wiener was there. Um, and so we, we have these people who are like foundational figures, especially Claude Shannon, in the history of inf- information theory and the history of, of AI, uh, who are attending these conferences. And then the Dartmouth conference is sort of the next generation of people after it, like Minsky and so forth. But but there's a, there's a generation before them in the 40s, and th- they're regularly attending these, these cybernetics meetings that were funded by the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation in New York City and Princeton. And uh, what's fascinating is that, like, it's not just information theory and, you know, if, we, if you will, proto AI people, people interested in very early digital computing. Um, it's also anthropologists. I mentioned that there's a guy who attends them, Heinrich Kluver, who's like one of the leading psychedelic researchers at that time. Um, it's, it's a really interesting grab bag of people. Warren McCulloch, who's like a famous neuroscientist, very early pioneer of neuroscience. So it, they're thinking about the brain as a computer and the computer as a brain-like organism. And, and so it's like this interesting interdisciplinary research being done largely hypothetically. You know, von Neumann is developing digital computers at this exact time. So he's definitely got his hands dirty and he's doing this. So is Claude Shannon. But they're talking in very um, abstract and future forward ways about, you know, pretty heady stuff. Like Margaret Mead, who was like one of the core group members of this cybernetics group, um, says somewhere that when when John von Neumann got had two two or three drinks, 
he started saying that maybe the universe is a giant computer simulating us <laughs> in the forties, you know? So a lot of that kind of discourse that we have today, um, I think is coming out of these 1940s people, not the 1950s people who are actually responding to it. And if, if you look at their biographies, what I, what you can call techno utopianism is, you know, kind of understandable considering that they were born or circa 1900. So one thing I talk about in the book is that they lived through the invention of, you know, airplanes, uh, radar, nuclear power, computers, really the mass adoption of automobiles in general, um, and and a ton of other things too that we just take for granted in everyday life. And so in their youth, these people saw unprecedented rates of change in the 20s, you know, 1910s and 20s, and they sort of extrapolated that into the future. There, there was also a lot of optimism in between World War One and World War Two, which I didn't really expect. You know, when I approached this, I saw it as like, oh, that was the Great Depression, Spanish Civil War, you know, rise of fascism, things are getting kind of scary. And all those things are true. But but in both the United States and in the Soviet Union, uh, like Russian cosmism, it's called cosmism was like a sort of techno utopian subset that was that was uh, in late imperial and early Soviet Russia you know, imagining space flight and, and so forth. There was a lot of um, sort of proto, like actual science fiction sort of yearning. You know, it, it makes sense that this is the origin point of, sci of modern science fiction, the 20s and 30s. And it spilled over into what everyday scientists were thinking about quite a bit. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in approaching this people. I'm looking at them as a group. Um, I, I'd like if you think about their biographies and dig into what they were thinking about in the 20s before they became famous as scientists, they're very motivated by this deeply optimistic framework, which then World War II and the Cold War really throws out of whack and demonstrates the, the flaws with, you know, the, the optimism they were showing was, I think, largely naive. And it was proven to be much more complicated in actual fact by the events of history. But there, there really was a very potent strain of utopian thought among these scientists um, involved in early computing, involved in um, in psychedelic research, but also other things as well, uh, which maybe we could talk about. Um, or like one example that I didn't get to fit into the book is that Alan Turing believed in ghosts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like he really did. It's like in there, uh, in his writings. And uh, he wrote about it in a very hopeful way. It wasn't like he like believed in ghosts in this sort of... Um, mystical way that he thought of as separate from his interest in science. He, he thought science would discover paranormal activities or, or he, he thought science would be a way, a tool for enlarging what we understand of nature, including the existence of ghosts. It sounds kind of strange to us today, but uh, there was a very expansive moment for people of that generation where they didn't know where the limits were going to, were going to be, you know, and, and they, um, they thought in a much more, uh, open-minded way, or perhaps you could say in a more naive way about science's power. I didn't know this about Turing. Was there anything in his writings that indicated like why this was a compelling thought to him, why he believed ghosts were a thing? I looked into this a little bit because I, I, um, yeah, he, he had a, um, a very close friend who he was in love with in, in high school in, when he was a student who died very young. And um, he became interested in like the possibility of communicating with that friend, uh, you know, after death. Uh, but really, it was pretty standard. Margaret Mead believed in extrasensory perception as well. And I actually interviewed someone, um, one of the last surviving MK Ultra test subjects, actually. Uh, oh wow! In in her um, in her nineties, and uh, she was a secretary for a psychiatrist who was consulting for the CIA, testing LSD in the fifties. And she agreed to be a test subject for this program. Margaret Mead was there. <laughs> and, and Margaret Mead was helping the psychiatrist do personality assessment tests of people on LSD. One thing I didn't realize is that Margaret Mead was also curious if um, LSD could basically could confer psychic powers on the user. So she remembered being asked various questions about, you know, card guessing games, like the kind of standard stuff that is used to test if people are psychic. Um, Margaret Mead was actually testing that on her while she was on LSD in the year 1954. Um, you know, obviously it, it, it's not real. It didn't, it was a totally false path it, for science, but it, that, that's the kind of thing that I was surprised to find among these leading scientists that they were, 
they were thinking um, about science in a way that like I didn't actually expect. And it was much more, not just more, you know, expansive, but also much more interdisciplinary, you know, like, uh, like why was Margaret Mead even there doing this? She was an anthropologist, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so those kind of questions came to mind when I was reading these things. Also, I don't know if this came up um, too much in your, uh, we haven't talked about it before, but uh, the history of Scientology, like there's like a whole um, period when L. Ron Hubbard was trying to befriend Claude Shannon and these early people that I've been talking about uh, and to try to get in on their little group of researchers. So there's a whole kind of um, pseudoscience world that accompanies the origins of AI, which I think might, I don't know, I, I've just been thinking about this recently because there's so much, as you know, um, hype around AI and people who are sort of making outlandish claims about it, that I, I feel like there's like a thread of pseudoscientific, um, you know, self-publicizing figures that is there from the beginning as well. Ultimately, Claude Shannon did actually become friendly with, with L. Ron Hubbard, but he didn't let him into his little group of researchers. And that was where it ended. But it's a little sideline. Interesting. Yeah, I, I do want to get into that a little bit more. I'm, I'm thinking of this this metaphor you kind of drew earlier, though. And I wanted to ask you about it. This was where you were talking about some metaphors that people made of the universe as possibly a giant computer simulation. And this has come up in multiple places. And I think that also has a connection to what you were saying about the way psychedelics researchers also thought about the human mind, maybe this computational framework where you could really, in a principled way, almost to draw the analogy program it like a computer, if you knew the right things and you did the right things with it. Why do you think that these analogies, everything for us, you know, for people who are doing AI research, for example, that analogy often gets drawn between the human brain and AI. And I think that there are different reasons people have for why this tends to occur. In, in your estimation, why do you think that some of these ideas, these analogies to the computational are, are so compelling to people and to some of these figures that we're talking about? I think that there's a tendency to use the, the prevailing leading technology as a metaphor for, the, for humanity throughout history. So there's the, a lot of famous um, images that you can find online from the early 20th century showing the human body and the brain as like a diesel engine or as like a complex, you know, machine with pistons and, and tubes pushing fluids around. And it's very much like a kind of, it kind of looks like a car engine from the thirties, you know? Um, if you go back a little earlier, people are thinking about the mind as maybe a filing cabinet, right? Index cards. You go, you go a little more recently, people think about the mind as, uh, as a computer. At, or, you know, so there's a tendency to kind of use the, the metaphor at hand that, that is like on our minds to explain the mind. And it, in every case, uh, it's probably not capturing the actual reality very well. It may actually be helpful as a, as a tool of commensurability, letting us talk about a comp very complex thing in a way that we can reference by like pointing to a technology people are more or less f familiar with. Um, you know, one, one thing that, that people used to talk about the mind a lot, which no one does anymore, is to talk, call the human brain a telephone, telephone switchboard relay, you know, like the old school um, AT&T switchboards. But we're still kind of doing that when we talk about it, you know, in, in comparing it to an AI system, uh, you know, trying to explain the unexplainable. Like fundamentally, we don't really understand the human brain very much at all. It's too complex to really have any kind of, um, you know, true conversation about really, unless we use metaphor. So I think a lot of it is that. I do think also um, computers, like one of the things that we find when we look at the, the origins of, of computing is that people are very interested in neuroscience early on. You know, the, the people using the term neuron in the 40s were also thinking about units of data, like like, you know, thinking about the act activation of neurons in a way that it could be compared to a circuit is very old. That's not like a new thing. That's from the beginning of the, of, of the history of computing and the history of neuroscience. So they've kind of been interwoven since the thirties and forties. 
Um, and I think that's still the case. I, I do think that things are getting a little more complicated now that we get into the world of LLMs because they raise other kind of troubling questions about how much the human brain is like an LLM, you know, um, just kind of groping toward the most plausible next word rather than actually having <laughs> any kind of forethought. Um, I think that's a new concern about the brain that, that I, has been on my mind a little bit <laughs> lately <laughs> as I think about what that can tell us. Um, what, one thing about psychedelics that I think is really interesting is the way they've been described by researchers since the 50s is this idea of reprogramming the brain. Uh, you know, so that term really does have to do with early computer research. It wasn't really used before that. Uh, the people who are studying psychedelics at this time are familiar with like punch cards. Very early, you know, mainframe computers were present in their research. And so, of course, the tools they're using are influencing their thinking. So there's like a direct interplay in terms of like, they actually do have access to these very early, very expensive computing systems, you know, the kinds that only large universities could have. Uh, one guy in particular, John C. Lilly, who re listeners to this may have heard of, he's the dolphin guy. <laughs> People, he's somewhat famous or infamous because he gave LSD to dolphins in his, his uh, laboratory in the Virgin Islands. But his lab was called the Communications Research Institute, which just as easily could have been like, you know, studying like the kind of old school AI, you know, of the 1960s. It sounds very much like those kind of institutes. And uh, he did have a very powerful computer that he had gotten from MIT. And he was trying to hook brains directly up to the computer. I'm still not sure exactly how he was doing that. But Lilly really was a pioneer of, of brain computer interfaces. Like he actually was one of the first people to, to put that in practice. And uh, he very much was thinking about this interplay because he ended up devolving into a pretty, um, uh, pretty much like a, a semi-religious belief system based on the view that there was a, a evil AI intelligence, which he called the solid state intelligence, which was like controlling the nature of reality. And it became really much like a fantasy story for him. Uh, but he was like a legitimate scientist of the 1950s. <laughs> you know, he, he taught at, um, he taught at Penn. He had a medical degree from Dartmouth. Um, he was trying to Caltech. He was funded by NASA. So it, it's a, he's a really good example of like the truly deep end version of this, um, crossover between psychedelics and, and, and neuroscience and computing. Yeah. I was reading something recently by another figure in psychedelics, Terrence McKenna, who I hadn't read anything by him before, and I, I'm guessing you're probably familiar with him, but for listeners who might not be, this guy was an American ethnobotanist, and he advocated for the responsible use of, of psychedelics. And he had some super interesting things to say that were very explicitly about this intersection. And I think the first thing that stuck out to me was the way in which this guy is very explicitly a, a McLuhanist about the whole thing, where he's thinking about both psychedelics and computational machines in general as like extensions of human function. And I think when you're making these analogies between the brain, the human as something that is fundamentally machinic in nature, then this kind of idea of what that extension looks like and the fact that these things that we're using are extensions comes quite naturally. Yeah, I, I, I want to say right now that I'm very skeptical of that way of thinking, actually. So I, I one of the things that you kind of learn as a historian of science is that um, when you're in a time period, it's very easy to think within the possible um, frameworks of that time period. And so it makes sense that in the 20th century, that way of thinking, you know, thinking of the, the brain as a computational machine, which can be reprogrammed and thinking in terms of expanding the limits of the human, you know, that, that's all very 20th century ways of thinking. I'm not sure it actually maps onto reality. I, I, I think psychedelics are valuable in a, in a limited way um, as a tool of personal insight. And in a medical context, I really think that they have great potential for treating specific mental health conditions like PTSD. I'm much more skeptical of like the, you know, they make you superhuman sorts of claims because those have been really, really um, abused in the past. And, and they've also, I think, partly have led to the, you know, the criminalization of psychedelics because you can't really make those claims about FDA approved substances, right? Um, and I also think that there's, uh, you know, a, a sort of guru tendency to sort of uh, 
make people making these claims elevated into these uh, mystical figures or even cult leader-esque sort of figures. That's partly why I'm interested in L. Ron Hubbard's early role in the story. And I, I, one of the things that I've taken away from just studying this history is to be a little bit allergic to like really sweeping claims about the nature of reality in general, <laughs> because I do think it has led um, scientists involved in the field and actually people in general in the 20th century. Um, it, it's been potentially a pretty damaging thing to, to um, confidently expect this like mass transformation of consciousness, which was a, what a lot of people in my book were hoping for. And I'm, I'm, I'd be much more happy with just a limited, like, we have a great new treatment for depression, or <laughs> we have a, um, you know, a legal psychedelic therapy, which lets people process issues in their life. Um, I kind of feel the same way about AI. Like, I feel like uh, a lot of the stakes are, are being portrayed in almost like Marvel superhero movie terms, where it's like the fate of the universe is at, at, on, you know, at risk. And he hangs in the balance. Uh, there really are massive transformations that I think will happen from LLMs in particular, but generative AI in general in the next 30, 40 years. Uh, kind of like the movie Her, I kind of see that happening. Um, except I don't really see the transcendent, you know, AGI story playing out in any way like people are talking about it, purely because you see that story over and over in the history of technology. You know, pe people imagining that something which really was transformative and deeply impactful will not just be that, but will be like the end of the world. You know, that's a very reoccurring theme. And at its most out there, I think some psychedelics boosters got into that wavelength. Timothy Leary, for one, thought that education would be replaced by taking psychedelics, that you would just like take a chemical that would teach you things rather than reading it in books. So that's pretty, you know, getting pretty out there into that realm. Um, and yeah, anyway, so I, I kind of think that I, one lesson I learned from writing this book was actually just intellectual humility about the kind of claims we, we make. I'm totally with you on the skepticism of these views and the need for humility. And one thing I want to ask you about, though, is say what you will about these narratives and, and their validity and the kinds of issues that they might have. I feel like there's a way to view them as kind of instrumentally useful in some sense. And I think this is a complicated picture because we're all familiar with the AI winters that happened when we sort of under delivered as a field on promises and the intersection of how do narratives work, what is actually considered progress. But it does feel like these overblown narratives really do draw a lot of interest in an area and excitement and people working on it. We saw this with what you've talked about in early psychedelics research. And right now in AI, we're seeing this really interesting trend of effective accelerationism, which I think is just one of the really, really interesting online subcultures of people who have these beliefs. And, you know, I haven't studied them well enough to really be able to fully represent it. But I think that one of the core elements here is that technological progress, AGI, what have you, feels inevitable almost. And so really the only thing left to do for a person is to buckle down and build and get us there faster. And I'm curious if you view these narratives as maybe instrumentally useful in the history of the development of, of an area like psychedelics, like AI, regardless of the issues with the narrative itself. I know it's kind of hard to evaluate counterfactuals, but I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah. Um... I, I have to, speaking of intellectual humility, I, I have to be like a little bit guarded in how I talk about it because I don't know a lot about the subculture. I've encountered it. I should say at the outset, I have a somewhat negative view of it, um, but I don't have enough knowledge to really make a claim there. I, I do think, you know, there's a reoccurring tendency to have a sort of engineering mindset, you know, toward these topics. And to think that if if the engineers take over or gain social precedents, uh, they can fix the problems and we're on our way to a smooth future. That hasn't really been borne out by reality. <laughs> so um, technocracy, you know, that we use this term technocratic a lot today. There was an actual technocracy movement that, in fact, Margaret Mead was part of early on. She was friends with the founder of it, Howard Scott. 
it's a really, really useful case study for people in that subculture to study as an example of the ways that way of thinking can lead you astray. So he was imagining the creation of what he called a technate, a sort of engineer run hybrid of capitalism, socialism, like a third way that would that would like create a better um, infrastructure and would rationalize and make more efficient the workings of the economy and would make technologically preeminent. Te- technology would be like the main uh, goal you know, of a, of a state. And it completely failed. It was a 1930s era pipe dream that could not get buy-in from ordinary people. And again, Howard Scott had cult leaderish tendencies. You know, founders of technocracy followers started wearing, like I think, capes and like little um, yin yang symbols sewn onto their clothing. And it all got kind of like uh, you know, got pretty weird. <laughs> suffice to say, um, and you know. Margaret Mead was fascinating because she saw that firsthand. She was drawn to it, uh, but she also studied the the formation of an apocalyptic cult off the coast of New Guinea in the fifties, and and saw them in similar ways uh, as re- responses of humans to rapid technological change, trying to form communities, trying to form uh, group ideologies that would let them make sense of that change, and feel positive and hopeful about it, and feel like they have agency. And to, to that extent, that, that's fine. Uh, I have no problem with it. But I do worry when it becomes a uh, the sort of social movement that claims hi- like a hierarchical relationship where the people who are in the in-group should have control of the levers of power that, or should um, dictate for others who don't belong to it, you know, what the future will be. One thing I liked about Margaret Mead is that she, because she studied these things rather than participating in them, she was able to step back and, and kind of think about them in a meta way, you know, not just being in one particular one, but to think about their characteristics as a whole. Um, the This sort of, um, she called them limit states, moments when people think that the future is approaching basically a singularity. She didn't use the term, but a moment of rapid change where everything will be different. And that there's like a group of initiates or insiders who are aware of this change and predict it better than others. And, you know, it sounds very familiar with this current online subcultures around this, but it's a reoccurring thing in human societies. And uh, you got to watch out for the cult leaders in those groups because <laughs> that's something that I think is very much part of human nature is that we want the charismatic preacher of doom or preacher of the millennium to tell us what to do. <laughs> so that's something I'm very wary about there. Um, yeah, I, I'll just stop there. <laughs> sure. To, to maybe hone in on another part of the question that I was thinking about, again, with these almost cultish-like tendencies, do you think that they, I guess, historically or, or even now feel necessary to get the kind of level and, and volume of interest for people into putting their lives, their efforts towards the development of a technology, whether that be AI or psychedelics? Like, do you think that those narratives are really important to this? Or do you think that, again, kind of the counterfactual is being difficult? If we didn't have these narratives about psychedelics as really revolutionizing things for the human mind, about AI as being this transformative technology in all sorts of ways, do you think that the progress could have played out differently, have been slower? No, I don't think that. I I think that... um... You know, this is very counterfactual and, and it's hard to make any firm judgment, but I, I think that in many ways that way of thinking has actually harmed forward movement in both those fields. Uh, it makes people not take them as seriously. It can lead people into some really strange decision making. You know, Sam Bankman Fried was just uh, judged guilty yesterday as of the time of this recording. And I think part of his bizarre story is that he was a true believer in this you know, an ideology which basically pushed him to take massive risks because he thought they were for the greater good. Um, And I I think that can be really dangerous. And so rather than seeing scientists as these messianic figures who are charged with transforming the world, uh, I think one of the takeaways of my book, that's actually why I called it Tripping on Utopia, (laughs) is um, you can trip over that. It can actually uh, lead you down a false path or you can break your nose. (laughs) It can can really screw up your life, actually. And uh, personally, I, I'm much more of a um, 
of the feeling that that just seeing science and technology and also what I do as an historian in, in incremental terms, in terms of real world impact with humility, with a sense of historical perspective and with a sense of, you know, you're just one drop in an ocean and there's other people with different ways of thinking, uh, different goals in life that we have to respect. I, I think that's a much better framework than I'm at the vanguard that will transform the world because people at the vanguard who think they're transforming the world as the 20th century has told us <laughs> are, can be kind of scary people. <laughs> you, should, you should treat them with caution. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really fascinating perspective just because I think that if you look into the AI world, you look at the people who are building things up in San Francisco, for instance, it feels like almost everybody views themselves as somebody who is doing something that in some way is going to transform or is going to contribute to that transforming of the world. And to what you said earlier, some ways this can form can be in this kind of hierarchical situation where there's people who are at the very core of it, who hold all of the levers of power, and then everybody else is kind of incidental, or maybe on the side. And in some ways, I, I guess the, the AI world feels a little bit like this at times. I think that, you know, if you look at open AI and such, it can feel like there is certainly a, a hierarchy there in terms of who holds all the cards. But at the same time, there's a strong sense of, well, the kind of progress that is being pushed forward is, is distributed in lots of ways with the open source software that is being developed. And again, open models that are allowing lots of people to do different things at the same time. And so it's it's kind of interesting just that like whoever you run into, there does seem to be this really core feeling of like, I'm doing something that is fundamentally important to to history. I think it is important to history. That's the thing. I, I think it's important to draw a distinction between making a real impact on history and ending history, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the, I'm very skeptical of claims that history is ending in any fashion. It just doesn't work that way. But I, I do think actually currently, you know, I, um, I'm an historian of technology and science, and I, I think we're living through a, a period uh, that historians will write about a hundred years from now. And some of these people will impact history. Um, I'm personally really, I think probably more on the positive side of it than most historians I know. In fact, almost all. Um, I, I really think LLMs in particular are amazing as a democratizing force in some ways. Like for instance, in terms of language learning, they're a game changer. It's like amazing how well they can teach languages. Um, they're really useful in teaching. But I also think, um, you know, it, there's such a mismatch between what we're actually seeing them doing in our society which is actually transformative in some ways, but not like, you know, the end of the world and the ways people are talking about them. Um, and so that I think is something to watch out for. If, if I was giving advice to a current young person getting involved in AI research, I would say, read about the history of technocracy, read about the history of psychedelics, because uh, they're both really, really um, instructive case studies in the ways that that things can go wrong when when there's an engineering mindset that is not allowed to um, like get feedback from people in the humanities, for instance, <laughs> people who study history, but also people who are just not who don't hold the same views. You know, there's an echo chamber effect sometimes, I think, in both the, the history of psychedelics that I looked at and in the present AI community, I think there's a bit of a um, tendency just to read people who agree with you or to, to kind of have debates, even internally, even if you think you disagree, you're coming at it from a similar framework fundamentally, you know? Um, it would be interesting also to think about it in international terms, how much this is a United States debate, whether it's a debate which is really adhered to elsewhere. You know, one thing I could mention here is the reason, one of the reasons I'm interested in AI is my wife, Roy Paksad, is an engineer and a a technology and AI policy researcher. She's born in Iran and she's from, she was born and raised in Iran and she moved here as an adult. And I think it's really important to hear people like that um, who just have a different national or cultural perspective uh, when we talk about technology, you know, like she lived through technological change in the eighties and nineties that, that in the United States was happening in the forties, uh, like mass electrification of the country, big infrastructure projects like dams and so forth. And uh, 
it can make you both a little bit more hopeful because you actually realize that people that technology is improving lives right now, but also more skeptical because, for instance, the Iranian government is is using technology as a mass surveillance tool, and so are many others. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think it, it's good to be grounded in the global reality when we talk about these things rather than the San Francisco perspective only. Yeah. And in, in speaking with your wife, I guess, about Iran's experience here, you did mention, of course, the fact that Iran has been using technologies for purposes that we might not like to see so much. But I'm curious if just you saw anything in terms of when America was experiencing some rapid technological change, you spoke to how we extrapolated this into the future. Do you know if in Iran or you know other countries we might look at there was maybe a fundamentally different response to this kind of technological change if that extrapolation wasn't quite the same. Something I think is really interesting about the history of, of like engineering projects in general or the history of technology in the 20th century is how rapidly it became international. So a lot of the people in the story I tell in Tripping in Utopia and in contemporary AI, AI research are um, you know, not American or, or if they live in the United States, they're from somewhere else originally. And so I think it's it's striking how much it's become a global community. However, it also shares many of the same views. So the idea that that um, that science and technology will uplift society and like uh, create a kind of uh, feedback loop of progress, very t- much a core twentieth century view, not just in the U.S. but in the Soviet Union, in Germany, in Japan. <clears throat> but it's kind of still continued today. Uh, it just got shifted to the digital realm. Uh, you know, I think there's a sense that um, there's a lot of skepticism about, you know, where is all the new, where is the flying car? You know, everything just became improving, you know, ad sales and so forth. But I also think that built into that, there's a huge amount of, of um, boosterism and and advocacy for seeing young people going into engineering as something that will like, fix the world, you know, that's, that's also a current thread. And uh, I, I think it's surprisingly international, but I do think that uh, when we approach it from a US centric point of view, we can see it in these sort of uh, blinkered ways. So, you know, calls for regulating AI, for instance, may be effective in the United States. I'm not at all convinced that there's just based on geopolitics that the United States has a history of overestimating its ability to be the global police of the world, right? So I really am very skeptical that that will work. And I think it's sort of a legacy of the Cold War that that people in the United States or the UK uh, are even thinking in those terms, you know, because th- those are the modes of thought of a global superpower, right? Um, and it's not necessarily the way people, it would make sense to people elsewhere. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't speculate more than that, but um, actually if people are interested, <laughs> um, my my wife does really work on these things and it's Taraz Research um, is, is the name of her organization. And she's like doing really fascinating um, work about the human rights impacts of AI and technology. So it's been something very much on my mind as I, as I research the history. Another, maybe a final question on this whole series of, of questions about narratives and things we're thinking about is one I suppose, aspect that we've kind of skirted around a little bit is the short-term, long-term kind of impacts frameworks that we see being debated in AI. And importantly, I suppose, is the kind of doomerous narratives, Eliezer Yudkowsky being kind of the most famous person who has been touting the, we're all like just fundamentally doomed and there's nothing we can do about it at this stage kind of narrative. And it does seem that people tend to just slip into this some way or another. And I guess he really, really did convince himself of this idea. And we've talked a little bit about how, of course, there is this natural tendency towards things like looking at problems from an engineering perspective, like looking at what we are doing as transformative. But the the negative side of that just feels so weird when we think about there are some really serious big figures who very seriously believe that we are kind of doomed. And I'm curious if you see analogs of that in the past and like why this is a draw for people. That's a really good question. Um, I, it's hard to speculate about human nature. I, I do think there is something internal in how humans think about their lives 
that makes that appealing, like the, the apocalyptic narrative. Um, I think part of it is it gives a sense of meaning to your life because you can have a feeling of urgency. Like I can help either avert catastrophe or I can be the, the Cassandra who, who alerts the world to the existence of it. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, currently I, I'm actually really surprised by how prevalent that tendency is. And I wonder how much it's sort of an aftermath of the nuclear era. A lot of it is sort of replicating things that that activists against nuclear were in the you know, 1960s through 80s were talking about. Very, It's very quite similar, the narratives. Um, it's also kind of similar to the early environmentalist um, narratives. You know, Gregory Bateson is another major character in my book. Margaret Mead's husband is a really fascinating thinker in his own right. And he was one of the first people to draw attention to global warming in 1968. You know, it was, scientists were talking about it, but he was one of the first people to give a public lecture about it but the ways it was presented were like ex even more catastrophic than what actually happened you know by the year 2000 the polar ice caps will have melted and we'll, we'll all be dead <laughs> you know was, and especially in the 70s the population bomb these books that were actually way way more pessimistic than the reality you know this is the world that gave us soylent green like this kind of it gave us post-apocalyptic movies really like that's the origin of that genre um it, it, we can learn a lesson from that, which is that I think humans sort of, uh, for whatever reason, seem to almost revel in imagining the most awful possible future. And they systematically underrate the likelihood of things staying more or less the same. <laughs> it's kind of ironic that people who love um, Bayesian statistics are always talking about something being radically different from the past, right? Because <laughs> if you just look at history, it's like you can usually say the next 50 years will be kind of like the last 50 years, even if there's a long-term trend in, in a certain direction. It's very unusual for things to be that different in that short of a time. Um, so I get a lot, personally, I get a lot of solace from history and it helps me like make sense of these kind of claims in my own perspective on them, which is again, a skepticism, I think probably will muddle through in much the same way we have through the 20th century, which also had a lot of people claiming we wouldn't live to see the end of it. Um, and I, I think that uh, one thing I try to warn my students about is the ways that having an over hasty assumption of the future can actually shape your own future in negative ways. You got to give yourself space to make decisions that aren't predicated on what someone else told you will happen in 20 years. You know, that's not a good way to live your life. Even if you do think, have, have a very pessimistic view of the future, I, I really worry about specifically people in their 20s right now who are kind of basing their whole life philosophy or personality even on the, on that doomerism, you know, in general, it seems to be quite prevalent among my students as far as I can tell. And I'm, it's made me be a little bit more optimistic just to kind of counteract it actually. Yeah. If you even look at this in a more limited sense, I am starting to see more and more people take very seriously the idea that coding as an activity we get paid to do will be kind of gone in 10 years. And, and actually, you know, I can see that a lot of like very routine coding tasks getting automated away seems like something that's very reasonable and like could happen. But there is still that back and forth I see of younger people like me who are beginning their careers as software engineers and are thinking about, well, now how do I think about the skills to focus on, what to do as a career in general, because I view this as a thing that's going to happen. And I think that you also see some more seasoned software engineers who are, you know, some of them are bought into this, but then others, I think John Carmack posted something about this, are like, you don't have to worry too much because yes, maybe coding gets automated away. Maybe a lot of it does, but there are so many other meta skills that come along with being a software engineer that you can really focus on. And so it's not as big a deal. Like coding is just kind of the delivery, but the real value it, a lot of it is also lying elsewhere. I agree. And I, th I think that um, this is the point where I would urge all your listeners to study the history of technology, read history, because one of the things you can learn from reading the history of the last 200 years is that there are people whose jobs get automated, made it away. It's happened in the past. It will happen in the future, but the meta skills become much more important in that context. Uh, you know, if you're learning programming in the 60s, you're using punch cards. 
obviously that's no longer a thing. And it's, it's just not even close to being a thing. It's completely gone. That skill set is entirely useless. <laughs> no one cares about it. And yet, uh, hopefully, the people, people who learned how to use punch cards had something else which was transferable. It, so we need to think about our educational system and be honest about the fact that there will be things changing very fast, I think, in the next 10 years because of LLMs in particular. Coding will be one of those things, for sure. I think that's already happening. Um, but it's not going to get rid of people's jobs if we're able, as a society, to adapt to it, learn from the past, keep a, keep a core optimism about it. You know, it's not going to destroy the world, I don't think. Uh, it will really affect certain forms of white collar work. You know, this is something Ethan and Lilac Malik have talked a lot about at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. You know, we're, we're watching a transformation of white collar jobs that's somewhat similar to the transformation of, of blue collar jobs, you know, industrial jo era jobs uh, that happened with automation in the 20th century. And we can really look at that history and learn from it. And actually, I think people graduating from college today or early in their career today really would be well served by looking at the history of technology in the 20th century and learning some lessons from it. I think the meta skills thing is right on. That's that's the main thing to focus on. Yeah, I think this is a really good lesson to take away. As maybe a, a last set of thoughts, we have talked a little bit about how AI might impact education and your general optimism about the ways that large language models can serve as this democratizing force. And you wrote this really wonderful Substack piece that I'll make sure I link to in our show notes about simulating history with ChatGPT. And I'm curious for you as an educator, maybe as a broad question, what do successful and unsuccessful versions of the future look like for you? where we're using these models in educational contexts? Really good question. I'm still figuring out my answer to it because of course the technology is changing really fast. You know, um, if GPT-5 comes up next year, I will have a very different answer. But uh, yeah, currently I'm using GPT-4 uh, pretty extensively in my classes as a learning tool for what I call simulating history. You can take issue with the the term because it's not actually a real simulation. It's sort of similar to the holodeck, you know, in, in Star Trek, where it's it's a somewhat of an entertainment, but also educational experience that's textual. Although I think in the future, it can have visual components too, that is basically riffing on or inspired by an actual historical source to generate the, the larger historical context. So if you give it you know, I, I experimented with, with uh, I wrote a really detailed prompt for this, which has all these guidelines and basically emulates MUDs from the 80s, you know, these like text-based role-playing games, uh, which is part of the training data. So it immediately knows what's going on. Daniel, I read your paper on, on in-context learning, and I was thinking about this because if you just start using MUD terms and just throw some, some, that, some of that terminology into it, it, it kind of like reminds it that it knows that framework and it just starts working within a role playing a text based role playing game framework really naturally because it's it's in the training data and you're just reminding it that um, and so I, I do that and then I give it some ground truth by giving it a primary source that's an actual real thing so like you can simulate the Macy Cybernetics conference by giving it a transcript of what Margaret Mead was saying to Claude Shannon blah 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 and then ask it to just imagine a different turn of events and you can go from there. And so I think that's fascinating because it gets students to think about history as something which people actually lived through. It wasn't just a series of events that happened and you read about them in a book, but you can you can get students to think about what choice would I make in this in this um, scenario, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, to take a really intense one. Um, and of course, that's really helpful for engaging them. It also gets them thinking about the limits of AI systems, even leaving aside like what they learned from history. They can say one one trend they've learned is that. ChatGPT in particular is way too optimistic. It always resolves conflict because of the real reinforcement learning from human feedback, probably prioritized, you know, seeking peaceful re resolutions, being friendly, being, um, you know, generally sociable. So when you ask it to simulate like the Cuban Missile Crisis, usually it has JFK and Khrushchev shaking hands and getting along at the end. <laughs> so that can be a very effective teaching tool because it's like, why did history go differently? Uh, it can also be effective, again, for this meta lesson of here are the affordances of current AI systems. 
here is ways of thinking critically about the ways they're training data and their subsequent fine tuning has shaped the, the output they give. It's not like an, you can't naively accept it as a representation of fact, but you can use it as a useful thinking tool for getting you to reflect on your own learning. And also you can learn some interesting stuff from it too. <laughs> like for instance, it, it's basically trained on Wikipedia. So anytime a historical figure is mentioned, you can just be like, okay, pause the simulation. Tell me more about the backstory of this person. And it's pretty accurate. You know, it'll give you basically a summary of the Wikipedia page for a given historical figure. In the future, I would like to explore using the API and making this um, something a little more complicated where perhaps it has more guide ropes. You know, it has a d more than one agent and one agent could be tasked with like fact checking things in real time or, or like, you know, directly consulting Wikipedia and just giving students like an actual, you know, output of like what Wikipedia says about a topic. That would be really interesting. In general, I think it's totally fascinating as a teaching tool. And that role is getting overlooked right now because of the emphasis on students cheating with it. But I expect in the next few years, there'll be more things along these lines of, you know, educational simulations will be big, I think, in this field. That makes sense to me. And I think the specific educational simulations you're speaking to, I really like because in that imagining of counterfactuals, alternate versions of history, I feel like that can definitely inculcate this agency we've been talking about in history, that things could happen otherwise, that, again, calling back to the inevitability narratives we've been talking about, history is, and the future as well, are absolutely not fixed and inevitable. And it's not the case that we're kind of static and can't really do anything about it. But again, the development, the use of the technologies that we have right now, that we will have in the future, those are so driven by human choices. And I feel like this kind of simulation too really can call attention to that. I, I completely agree. Yeah. I think this is a really good set of thoughts to end on. Professor Bean, I, I really appreciate your work. I'm very excited for the release of your book, Tripping on Utopia. And I want to thank you for such a thoughtful discussion and for taking the time to share your work with me. Thank you, Daniel. And I, I said this before we started recording, but I want to just thank you for doing this. You know, you really are making primary sources for historians by doing these interviews. So I appreciate that. And I, thanks for the thoughtful questions too. It was fun. That is all we have for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Again, if you enjoy what we're doing, there are multiple ways to support us. If you like the podcast, you should make sure that you're subscribed on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this. And finally, you can find our other articles and newsletters by subscribing to us on Substack and at thegradient.pub.